instrumental variable to understand it, to generate the kind of variation in, in income through the natural experiment to allow us to study this. Okay. More sort of classification here. Okay, talk about the three variables. Now we need three conditions to make IV work. There are three conditions, and you guys, through your questions, have actually already pinpointed all of them. So let's just put them all down on paper. The first condition, this is what Michelle was highlighting, is we actually need there to be a first stage. This is sometimes called the relevance condition. The instrument needs to be relevant to the endogenous variable. You need a strong relationship between the instrument and the endogenous variable in the first stage. Relevance, first condition. And going back to our sort of setup before, you know, basically the relevance condition means we have to have some sort of meaningful first stage here. And if we do, then we can start thinking about what the second stage looks like. Yeah. Yeah. So here with relevance, there's a whole literature that I, we don't really have time to get into in this course, but if you're interested, it's a very important literature, which is what's called the weak IV literature. So obviously, the stronger the statistical relationship in the first stage, the better. It just means that this natural experiment is really driving your endogenous variable. But in some cases, you only have a weak relationship. Maybe it's marginally significant. Maybe the magnitude isn't that big. And the question is, what can we learn in those cases? There's a lot more weak instruments out in the world than strong instruments. That's just the way it works. It's hard to find good natural experiments. So there's a whole branch of theoretical econometrics on how can we use weak IVs. Here, our IVs, in this case, are right on the border of weak and strong. They're definitely significant at 99% and whatnot. But in terms of the magnitudes and the significance levels together, they're right on the edge. They're not weak IVs, but they're not like super strong. They're kind of an intermediate case. So. Um, when you have IVs much weaker than we have in this case, you, you need to use different approaches. The standard instrumental variables approaches don't work anymore. What about the magnitude? Well, significance is going to matter a lot, and magnitude will as well. The number of instruments matters as well. The more instruments you have, you gain certain advantages, but there's also certain problems you run into. It's a, it's a very interesting and active branch of theoretical econometrics right now, the last decade. Um, but thankfully, as I said, here we're not in that weak instrument area. We're kind of in a gray area where it's okay to use the standard methods. Okay, so this was our kind of layout. Rainfall growth to economic growth to conflict. Instrumental variable to endogenous variable first stage. Endogenous variable to outcome variable second stage. We talked about the first assumption, relevance. The second assumption is exogeneity. And I've used that word, exogenous. Exogenous just means that the variation we're looking at is sort of outside of the system of the endogenous variable and the outcome variable. In other words, there's no feedback from growth to weather or from civil war to weather in Sierra Leone. So whether people, if people are fighting on the ground in Sierra Leone or not, that doesn't affect the weather. It doesn't affect the amount of rainfall. That's the assumption. Now, at a global level, it certainly is the case that economic conditions affect climate. But the idea here is over a particular African country, whatever's going on on, on the ground that year is not affecting the weather above that country. That's basically exogeneity here. The third assumption is what's called the exclusion restriction. And this is what several of you put your fingers on before. This one is usually the most challenging assumption for instrumental variables. Number three, in research conferences and research seminars, whenever people use instrumental variables, half the time is spent arguing about point number three. And the assumption is rainfall growth only affects conflict acting through economic growth. If rainfall growth or drought directly affects conflict for some reason, or if rainfall growth affects something else other than economic growth, and that affects conflict, both of those constitute violations of the exclusion restriction. In other words, Maybe rainfall growth is affecting conflict through five or six channels. So assuming it only goes through that one channel is just wrong. You're missing the point. It's theoretically wrong. It's very hard to prove whether an exclusion restriction is good or bad. And that's why there's often debates about it. Yeah, yeah. The exclusion restriction for this analysis is exactly what's stated here. The rainfall, rainfall growth only affects conflict through economic growth. And here you can think of a lot of you know, just economic factors that rainfall growth may affect that aren't Economic growth. So, for instance, when we started this paper, we were trying to get all the data we could, not just on economic growth, but things like rural poverty. We were thinking, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, rebel movements and uprisings in Africa are rural uprisings. Maybe what matters is rural income or rural poverty or rural inequality. We couldn't get that data consistently across all countries. The only economic data we could consistently get for all years in all African countries was economic growth. Now, it's also a good summary measure. I mean, sort of the natural first thing to look at. But we were never wedded to this as saying, like, I, you know, we think this is the only channel. So, in some ways, we always knew the exclusion restriction had sort of this critique that could be leveled against it. And I'll talk about what you can do if you don't believe the exclusion restriction. There are things you can do. We'll talk about that. Okay. Let's take a breath. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you're raising a very good question. How can we test number two? How can we check that this is the case? One way you can do it, this is a common way to do it, is if we're afraid that, say, the endogenous variable or the outcome variable affect the instrument, so economic growth or conflict affect the instrument, we can do the following. This is actually a good test. We can regress rainfall. So in our regression, it's on the left-hand side, it's the outcome. Regress rainfall on last year's economic growth and last year's conflict outcome. And if, if there is a relationship, then we're really worried. Then we're saying, wait a minute, like in our data, economic growth in Sierra Leone is affecting weather the next year. If we found that, we'd be really worried about that instrument. I mean, that's like proof of endogeneity, basically. So that's often what people do, is they say our instrument should not be affected by lagged values of the endogenous variable or the outcome variable. You're saying, what if it's just in the, that year? I see. That's interesting. Okay, so then that, that's, a little more, that's a little trickier. So to the extent that there's no lag relationship, it's just like instantaneous, then um, it's a little harder to use the test that I said. But the test that I said is very commonly used as a kind of diagnostic for instrumental variables. It's very similar, and I'm going to draw these schematically in a couple slides, and that's effectively one of the that's one way of thinking about uh, about it. It's not, but there's there's multiple ways to think about the exclusion restriction. I'll, I'll show you schematically, but your point is one of the one of them. Is there another hand? Okay, clicker question. In your view, which is likely to be the most important violation of the exclusion restriction: the effect of rainfall on road quality, 
the impact of rainfall on economic outcomes other than per capita GDP growth, the effect of rainfall on other weather conditions on individual mood or aggression. There are too many potential violations to count. I'm pretty confused. Okay, so a lot of point B, effect on other economic outcomes other than GDP growth, the effect of weather directly on people's aggression or mood, many, and I think, again, these are all plausible. Some people talk about road conditions. Road conditions are interesting. You know, if you find that, you know, lots of rainfall is associated with less conflict, is it just a case when there's lots of rainfall, the roads, which are mainly mud roads, just all get washed out? So people really want to fight, but they can't. So that's one, I mean, that is often raised in our paper. In fact, we have a whole subsection of our paper trying to address that because we're able to get road data. We said actually road quality doesn't change that much, you know, even when there's more rainfall. So these are, these are all very plausible, and we've spent a lot of time trying to, to address some of these, uh, these points. Okay. So here we go. Three conditions, and here they are schematically. First stage, relevance. Second, second point, exogeneity. Third point, exclusion. The first stage is really just this first link. So we already know that. I think we all feel comfortable with, with the first stage. Oops, I still have that plotted. Not bad. Okay. Exogeneity. So what is exogeneity? This is my schematic. We still have rainfall to growth to conflict. Exogeneity means there's no feedback from these guys back to rainfall growth, nor is there some other factor X which drives rainfall growth. So maybe there's some other factor X which affects conflict. Remember, we're calling X all these limited variables that affect conflict. There's none of those X's that also drive local rainfall growth. That would also be a violation of exogeneity. It would mean that there's something in this system that affects rainfall growth. So what we're saying here is neither conflict nor growth nor these other factors affect rainfall growth. It's out of the system. It varies like an experiment that's not touched by these other relevant variables. That's very important. So let me pause and see if there's questions on this. Okay, that's exogeneity. Yeah. Exactly. So that, that's an X. If some factor that affected conflict, both affected rainfall growth and affected conflict, we're still in an omitted variable bias world. And that's something that happens is sometimes people think they have an instrument, but in fact their instrument is still affected by those deeper factors. So. And this is the second schematic for the exclusion restriction. The idea with the exclusion restriction is rainfall growth does not affect conflict through any other channel. And what I should have put here as well is it doesn't affect rain, rainfall growth doesn't affect conflict directly itself. If for some reason it's not like there's another channel, it just directly has that effect. But this is a simpler way to, to put it. So here on the, on the clicker question, it could be high temperatures make people aggressive. It could be, no, it's not income growth that matters, it's rural poverty that matters. Both of those would be exclusion restriction violations. When you have an exclusion restriction violation, imagine we're in a world where we have one instrument and we know it affects our outcome of interest through two channels. Imagine for some reason we know there's exactly two channels. But there's no easy way for us to distinguish between how much of the effect of the instrument is working through channel A or B. That happens a lot in data. What people will do is they'll just show the link between the instrument and the outcome, and that's called the reduced form. That's what I'll show you next. And they say, look, for some other reason we know it works through these two channels. I can't tell you if it's 50, 50, 60, 40. I can't break it down, but I know it's through these two channels, so I'm gonna show you the reduced form, the effect of the instrument on the outcome. That's what people typically do. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just, we're calling X here these omitted variables, so that's right. If there's something else that drives rainfall patterns that's just independent of conflict and independent of economic growth, it actually has to be both, that's fine. So whatever the underlying processes that drive weather, and there are many different factors, that's fine as long as those factors don't directly kind of relate to the omitted factors X, economic growth, or conflict. So there's a lot of assumptions, right? We're, we're saying that this instrument needs to fulfill within each of these exogeneity, say, claims. There's multiple assumptions in here. There's multiple assumptions in here. We need a strong instrument, et cetera. So there's a lot you need to do to, to make IV estimation work. It's not like an RCP, treatment, control. It's more complicated. Okay, I just mentioned the reduced form. The reduced form is the regression of the outcome on the instrument. So this could be useful if we don't believe the exclusion restriction, or we just can't figure out what the channels are. And again, here for the reduced form, I'm going to be using the subscript zero. So there have been three equations so far. Reduced form, first stage, second stage. Those are the three you need to create an IV estimate. So what does the reduced form look like? And here, we'll do it both for conflicts and with wars. We're saying conflict of 25 battle deaths and conflict of 1,000, which people call war. We get similar answers with both. Here we're finding when we regress the outcome on the instrument, growth and rainfall, we're finding negative point estimates in both specifications. In column one, lagged rainfall, last year's rainfall is significantly negatively related to conflict in the next year. In other words, if I had more rainfall last year, I have less conflict next year. Here, with the 1,000 death threshold, both current rainfall growth and lagged rainfall growth both matter, and both lead to less conflict. So this is the reduced form relationship. What we've basically shown so far is in the first stage, more rainfall, this rainfall growth, is associated with higher incomes. In the reduced form, we've shown that more rainfall growth is associated with less conflict. Instrumental variables methods combine those two relationships to basically tell us how much, if we make the assumption that all of this effect is working through economic growth, what is the magnitude of the effect of economic growth on conflict? And this is how we do it. I already showed you the reduced form. And recall the second stage, regressing war on growth. We can combine the first stage and the reduced form to estimate V2. That's what we want to do. Our goal here is V2. So this is some intuition, and then I'll go through two sets of equations. The intuition is, if rainfall has a big effect on economic growth, but it doesn't increase war risk, then it kind of seems unlikely that 
economic growth affects war risk, right? We have a natural experiment. Let's say we believe the natural experiment. We have a good first stage. All of this year-to-year -year variation in weather really is pushing income up and down. If that natural experiment of good and bad weather doesn't have any effect on conflict, but it's pushing income up and down, it kind of feels like probably income isn't affecting conflict. Because if it were, then as income gets pushed up and down by the natural experiment, we'd see some reaction in conflict. That's the idea. In contrast, if our conditions are satisfied, and as income gets pushed up and down by rainfall in those same countries in those same years, we see conflict going up and down, then it feels much more likely that these things are related. So this is actually the formal expression of that. What we care about is V2, an estimate of V2, the effect of economic growth on war. We can represent this by V0 divided by V1. So I've already shown you those expressions. This is the IV's impact on war. This is the reduced form relationship divided by the IV impact on growth. So you can see right away, if there's no IV impact on growth, if this is zero, this is not a very well-defined quantity if we're dividing three by zero. We need to have a meaningful significance level and magnitude here in order to make sense of this ratio. The first stage here, this magnitude, when people talk about instruments, is a scaling factor. It scales the reduced form impact of the IV on war. If the IV impact on war is zero, but this is a very large effect in the first stage, we're going to have a precisely estimated zero over there. We're going to know, hey, this natural experiment moved around income, but it just did nothing to war. That's a zero effect. If the IV is moving around income, and war is sort of moving around with the same pattern, driven by the same natural experiment, then what we're getting here is the effect of weather on war divided by the effect of weather on income. Do that in your head. The effect of, so it's, you know, effect, so it's war, divi it's war divided by weather divided by income growth divided by weather. It's a partial derivative. If you do those, what do you get? You get the effect, you know, of growth on war. It's war over growth. Just do, think of it as algebra to start. This is a partial differential. This is, you know, change in war per change in weather. This is change in growth per change in weather. The changes in weather cancel out, and we get change in war per change in growth. So thinking of it algebraically is the simplest way, but actually derivatives are just kind of not that different than that. Okay, let me pause. Any questions on this? Okay, so what does this look like? We have one minute and then we'll wrap up. What do we, what do we get here? The IV estimate is actually very large um, and significant out of this exercise. This is basically V2 hat, and well, actually I'm out of time. So we'll just finish off this discussion at the beginning of lecture next Tuesday, but this Thursday Marshall Burke will be here speaking on income shocks using very similar weather data, almost the same weather data, and HIV.